morning, everybody. Welcome to First Baptist Church, whether you're here in person or watching it online on Tuesday. And uh, we're glad you're here. Let's open our service in prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity that we have to gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the family of God, to um, meet with each other, to encourage each other, to hear from you, to worship you, to pray and leave our, our needs and our prayer requests at your feet. Thank you, Lord, that um, we are at this point in this pandemic that we're able to be together again and, and able to um, encourage each other in person. And so, Lord, I just pray that this morning that you would meet each of us where we are. Those of us who've come here from a very difficult and challenging week, I pray, Lord, that you would meet us where we are, that you would speak your peace and your comfort and your guidance and your direction to our hearts. Those of us who come from a week that has just been amazing, um, help us, Lord, to be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving to you. And for those of us where it's just been another week, we thank you, Lord, just for being with us in the routine, being with us in the mundane things of life, the things we have to do every day. Thank you, Lord, that you care about those things. And thank you, Lord, that you are constantly with us. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just bless this service and that we would leave this place in some way different from the way we walked in. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as things have changed COVID-wise, I was talking to, well, we were exchanging messages from the health unit, so we're kind of back to where we were last summer, where you, once you're seated and you're six feet away from anybody, not in your bubble, you can remove your mask if you feel comfortable. Um, but if you get up to go to the washroom or as we get up to leave, you got to put it back on, kind of like in a restaurant. So that's kind of how it works. And so rule of thumb, if you're moving, put on a mask. If you're stationary, <laughs> you can take it off. Ruth. And uh, uh, as we begin uh, our service this morning, we're going to be singing some songs together, and um, you are certainly welcome to sing along if you know the songs. Um, remain seated as we do that. And um, again, in our, our, our adventures in understanding the, uh, the, the regulations and, and the best practices that are advised to us, that's kind of where we've landed. But uh, yeah, um, feel free to sing. And um, I got to say that, you know, all this, all the changes that we've been through trying to understand the, the, the rules, you know, there's a one rule one day and then the next day that rule doesn't apply anymore. And then the week after that, guess what? That rule's back again. And it, it really sort of, it gives me a new appreciation, honestly, for just for God's faithfulness. Just the fa fact that he doesn't change, that he is who he has always been. And he asks of us the same things that he has always asked of us and that he helps us to understand those things and his spirit works in our hearts to, to bring us to a clarity and a confidence that um, when we come to him, he is going to receive us. When we speak to him, he is going to hear us. When we send him a, a desperate plea for help, we will get a reply. And um, we're going to sing some songs. Some are old, some are new. And I hope that you will sing along with us this morning. As we praise the God who created the world. We praise the God who created us and who gave us to each other in families and faith communities and neighborhoods and in friendships for the beauty of the earth.
the beauty of the earth, he's with us. In the passing of moments and of days, he is with us. In the chaos of nature and in the order of the universe, he is with us. In the faces of friends and of family and of strangers, he is with us. And from the rising to the setting sun, he is with us. So we sing our gratitude and we sing our praise. Chris, if you come and you good. If you yeah, if you want to do it from there, nice. You're loud enough. Yeah. Uh, two portions from Mark chapter uh, Mark chapter six, starting at verse thirty. The apostles gathered around Jesus to report to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, "Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest." So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, so he began teaching them many things. And over to verse 53. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. 
soon as they got in the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran through that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever they went, the villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in marketplaces. They begged him to, to let them touch even the edge of his clothing and all who touched him. Thank you, Chris. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through it. And give us ears to hear what you want to say to us this morning. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time, Father, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So that scripture reading from Mark is actually being read in churches all around the world today. And it's made up of two portions of the chapter that actually bookends two miraculous events in Jesus' ministry. There was about 20 verses between the two portions that Chris read to us. And in between those, we saw the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus miraculously took bread and fish, five loaves of bread and two fish, or was it five fish and two, no, five loaves and two fish, and broke it up and, and fed 5,000 people with it, and Jesus walking on water. And in these two bookends that we've read this morning, we see how Jesus relates to his disciples, and we see how he relates to crowds of people. And from these brief passages, I think we can learn something about how we are called as Christians to, uh, what we are called to do as believers, how we're to relate to those around us, and how we are to connect with God. So in verse 30, we see the disciples are gathering around Jesus. They've just returned from their first ministry trip on their own. Jesus had just sent them out two by two without him to go and preach the gospel of repentance, to heal the sick, and to cast out demons in Jesus' name. And now they're returning to report to Jesus all that happened. And I could just imagine them almost being like excited kids, you know, wanting to report to mom and dad, oh, you couldn't imagine what's going on. This was so amazing. And I can imagine each disciple being very impatient and talking over each other, saying, I want to tell my story now and, and to tell about all that God did through them as Jesus sent them out. For up until that point, up until Mark 6, it was really Jesus who had done all the preaching and all the teaching and all the miracles. This was the first time that God had worked through the disciples in these ways. And I imagine when, when they were first sent out, they might have been kind of apprehensive, wondering, can we really do what Jesus is sending us out to do? I mean, it's one thing to be part of the preaching and the miracles when Jesus is around, but, but here he is sending us out on our own to do the very things he's done. And he's sending us out by ourselves. But the thing is, they weren't on their own. For Christ's power had gone with them. And now they wanted to share with Jesus all that they'd experienced. You're not going to believe this, Jesus, but, oh yeah, you are going to believe it, because, yeah, you're, that's why you sent us out. And today Jesus still sends out his disciples out to make a difference for him in this world, to share with others the message of the gospel, to tell others about our own experiences with Jesus, to serve others in Jesus' name to step out and do things for God that might make us apprehensive at first, wondering, can I even do this? Dare I say, he even sends us out to share gifts of healing with the sick, perhaps even to face off against the demonic and be victorious. And if any of these tasks seem you know, somewhat beyond our capabilities, well, that's the point, they are. But Jesus never asks us to do something, never sends us out to do something without giving us the strength and the power to carry it out through his Holy Spirit. We are saved by the grace of God simply because God loves us and he wants us to be with him daily, now, and forever in eternity. But we're also saved for a purpose to be sent out to be God's hands and feet on earth, to be Jesus with skin on, making a difference in this world in his name. Now this mission that Jesus has given us seems pretty action focused at first. And it can really feed into sometimes our Western society penchant to always be doing something. We've always got to be busy. We've always got to get things done if we're going to be successful. If our life is going to matter, I've got to be doing something. 
But Jesus modeled, modeled a life of balance for his disciples then and for his followers now. Now we see a pattern in these early chapters in Mark, and we've been looking at it at our Monday night Bible study, that wherever Jesus went as his fame and renown began to spread, he quickly gathered a following. People would hear about his arrival, his pending arrival in a town or a village, and it wasn't too long before a throng of people gathered around Jesus and his disciples, wanting them, to, wanting to hear what he had to say, wanting him to touch them and heal them. And in our passage, we're told that so many people were coming and going that the disciples didn't even have a chance to grab a bite to eat. So Jesus did something that would be anathema to the workaholic, would go against the grain even of Christians who are so passionate to be doing, doing, doing things for Jesus. He said to his disciples, come on, let's get away from here. Go somewhere quiet where you can get some rest. A number of years ago when I was working with Youth for Christ, I you know, couldn't really afford to go many places on vacation, so I had an intentional staycation. And I stayed in Port Hope, but I made myself as invisible as possible. I, I didn't go anywhere, didn't go online, didn't answer the phone if I could avoid it, didn't go near a computer. I just wanted to rest and decompress at home. And I, as part of that week, I planned some reading I wanted to do. And perhaps ironically, one of the books I read was When I Relax, I Feel Guilty. That was the title of the book, When I Relax, I Feel Guilty. And the point of the book was to develop a theology of, le of leisure to emphasize the fact that both rest and leisure are biblical and important. We don't do rest and leisure very well in North America today. Even vacations are sometimes filled with the schedule of things. We've got to do this. We've got to go here. We've got to go there. We've got to make all these appointments that we've made in our mind. We can have a hard time just doing nothing. But at the same time, if you're like me, we don't do nothing very well either. We end up getting actually lazy. And rather than doing things that would be refreshing and rejuvenating, we end up feeling like we've wasted our time. Jesus calls his disciples in Mark 6, and he calls us in specific times today to come to a quiet place and get some rest. We need to do that, and we need to not feel guilty about it. We also need to focus on what Jesus told them before he encouraged them to rest. He said, come with me and get some rest. In the midst of the busyness of our life, Jesus is constantly calling us to, to come away, to come be with him, to find rest in his presence. One of the Ten Commandments that, even in the church, let alone in the world, we tend to not take seriously anymore, is the commandment to have a Sabbath, to have a day of rest. And I admit, I do not do Sabbath well. And I would argue that maybe that many Christians don't. But God instituted a rhythm in life from the beginning of time where one day out of seven is given over to rest, to doing things in that day that are very different from what we would normally do. And included in that Sabbath rest is the response to Jesus' call to come with me. Sabbath is not meant to be a duty, uh, a rule, something that's onerous for us to keep. Jesus said that, that the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. It's God's gift to us to help us keep the rhythm of life that he has created us for. It ensures rest when we feel like there's just no time for rest. And like I said, I'm preaching to myself here more than anybody. I don't do Sabbath or rest well. I know I need to develop a better rhythm of life. And I think many of us could say the same thing. And in these few words of Jesus, he shows us where a healthy rhythm in life begins. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So Jesus and his disciples headed out in a boat to try to find that quiet place, but the crowds would not let them escape that easily. They figured out where Jesus' boat was, was going to come ashore, and when Jesus and his disciples landed, even bigger crowds were there than before, waiting for them. 
Now, how Jesus reacted here can teach us something about how we are to react to people around us. I mean, he could have been angry, could have been frustrated. Just, just, could you just leave us alone for a few minutes? He could have seen the crowd, turned to his disciples and said, okay, guys, back in the boat. Let's get out of here. We've got to ditch this crowd. No, the passage tells us that Jesus had compassion on them. And that's a challenge for us, to allow Jesus to work in our lives so that we have compassion for people. Compassion when they intrude on our free time. Compassion when they make constant demands on us that, that make us so worn out. Compassion when they say and do things that you know will only land them in trouble. Compassion when they say and do things that, well, Never to expect people to act like Christians until they actually are. Rick Warren said that. It always sticks in my mind. Jesus had compassion on them because he knew, the scripture says, that they were like sheep without a shepherd. They didn't have anyone to guide them as a shepherd would. They didn't have anyone to protect them as a shepherd would. They didn't have anybody to feed them as a shepherd would. Sheep without a shepherd roam aimlessly. Sheep without a shepherd are lost. And this gives some insight into how we are relate to those in the world around us. In today's polarized society, it's so easy to get sucked into debates on different topics, including debates relating to morality and faith. It's so easy to just see the other person as wrong, as stubborn and unwilling to see my way of thinking, see how foolish and nonsensical their arguments might be. We just see them as, well, wrong. And perhaps they are wrong, but that's the result of a journey through life without a shepherd. I wish I could remember where I read this so I could attribute it properly, but this is something I stole. <laughs> it's not original. You know, I want you to think that I thought this up, but it just made a lot of sense to me. I read someone comment that we as Christians, that as Christians interact with people who are not yet believers, pre-Christians, as one author calls them, we can more effectively build important relationships with them and share the gospel with them when we begin to see them not as wrong, but as lost. Not as wrong, but as lost. And I'm not saying that there's no right and wrong. There is, and we need to uphold that. But in so many cases, people are holding on to wrong ideas about God, wrong ideas about sin, wrong ideas about life, basically because they are lost. Incredible as it may seem in a society with churches all over the place, in, in a town like ours with, with 12 churches, there are still so many people who, when it, when it comes to, to faith and spiritual matters, are lost. And many who are lost without even realizing it. So Jesus looked on this crowd with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were roaming aimlessly without a purpose. They were lost. And rather than just see them as wrong, rather than engage them in a debate or treat them with anger or condescension, he had compassion on them. He saw them as lost. And so scripture says he began to teach them many things so that they can go from lost to found. If we are to follow Jesus and his disciples in this passage, we too must be willing to teach those around us what they need to do to be no longer lost, but rather be found. And we are all in different, um, in different ways and contexts. We're all called to be teachers, to help people understand Jesus better to help people know and understand how God has created them to live, why he has put us here, what his purpose for our life is supposed to be. But I'm sure there are many of us who would stand up and say, me, teacher? No, no. We'd all feel, many of us feel very unqualified because we're still learning ourselves. I mean, there are topics and subjects from scripture that I sometimes either avoid preaching on or would really have to push myself to preach because there's this voice inside my head that's saying, who are you to teach this? You're still learning it yourself. But we don't do this in our own strength and with our own understanding. Jesus helps us understand what we need to know about him. He, he guides us by his Holy Spirit. 
He's given us his word to read and study and to learn from. And he gives us discernment so that we'll know what to say, when to say it, when to speak and when to be quiet and just listen. We are called to teach those around us about Jesus. Often that's through our behavior and our example. Often it's through our words. Most of the time it's through both. And what God asks of us is a willingness to be a teacher. A willingness to step out of our comfort zone and help those around us who are lost and floundering in life to become found in Jesus. What God asks of us is a willingness to be taught ourselves. For the best teachers are also really, really good learners. There is always something to learn and to wrap our minds around the creator of the universe. God wants to teach us and mold our worldview so that it matches more and more what God's intentions for the world are. His desire is to mold us in word and action into the image and likeness of Christ. And that'll take surrender. Surrender of our worldview, surrender of our way of looking at things, surrender, surrender of our right to consider ourselves right without any consideration of what God has to say on the subject. And it will take a bit of work and a bit of study. There are many people who have lived many years of their lives going to church and yet who honestly still know very little of the basic truths of Christianity. So know very little of the gospel itself and what it's all about. I think sometimes those of us who've been in church for many years, and I include myself there, can take things for granted. It's actually so refreshing to, sit, to watch a new believer as they get so excited about learning things about Jesus that we've taken for granted, learning new things about faith. It's like a whole new perspective has been opened up for them and they're just lapping it up. For the reality is that once they were lost, and now they're found. We need to continually get to know Jesus better, continually understand what it means to be found by him, continually develop the deep sense that God wants us to help others become found too. God wants us to help teach the lost how to become found. And when you think about it, that's actually quite an honor that he wants to include us in that process. So in the second half of our scripture reading, we see Jesus and his disciples cross over the Sea of Galilee and land at Gennesaret. But as soon as they get out of the boat, Mark tells us, the people recognize Jesus. I mean, he hadn't really done anything yet or said anything yet, but still they recognized him. And they immediately ran to the boat and gathered up those who were sick and gathered up those who were in need of healing and brought them to wherever Jesus was. They recognized who he was and what he can do. They recognized that he could change lives. The first half of the chapter also uses that same wording that when Jesus and the disciples tried to quietly leave by boat to a solitary place and get some rest, the crowds recognized them and followed them. And as I thought about the, the double use of this word, recognize, recognition, and as I noticed that the crowds were described as, as readily recognizing Jesus, they recognized him not just because of his physical features. They recognized him because of what he did and what he said. They recognized him as someone who, who taught them in a way that no one else ever had, as someone who helped them understand who God was, how, how much he loved them and, and what he required of them. They recognized him as someone upon whom God's power rested, enabling him to do things that, that others couldn't do in order to, to bless others, in order to change their lives, to heal them, to make a difference. They recognized him for the compassion he showed. They recognized something very different, very powerful, very attractive about Jesus. And because of that, people followed him to wherever he was. And many moved from being lost to being found. And it got me thinking, as a Christian, how would people recognize me? How would people recognize us as believers? How would people recognize the church? Would we be recognized in a guilt by association kind of way as that organization that ran those horrible residential schools? 
Would we be recognized only for our physical features, our great old buildings in a town that loves great old buildings? Would we be recognized more for what we're against than what we're for? As individuals and as a church, depending on how much we let our faith show, would we even be recognized at all? Or would we be recognized for our compassion? Would we be recognized as people who give people who may be ignored by society, give them the sense that they matter, even if it encroaches on our own personal time to do that? Would we be, be, rec would we be recognized by what we teach? And that even if it's something that people might disagree with, we teach it in such a compassionate way that, that it will get people thinking and get people listening, even a little bit to what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to them. Would we as a church be recognized as a place where people would bring their friends who need healing, whether that's physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing? Would we be recognized as a place where people willing to admit that they are lost would come because they recognize that this could be the place where they could become found? Are we recognized as people who have been sent out into the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus? Would be, we be recognized by our excitement over what God is doing in our lives and have an overflow where we impact lives around us and where God works through us to impact those around us? Would we be recognized, as the disciples were in the book of Acts, as people who had been with Jesus and who had responded to that call to come away and be with him? I think we all want to be recognized. No one likes being ignored. When I've run youth groups in the past and the whole night was a disaster and they were getting out of hand, I would try to get their attention and bring things back on track. And I would often tell them the only thing worse than being disobeyed is being ignored. We want to be recognized. And honestly, we will be recognized in some way by everyone around us. And the question is, how do we want to be recognized? What kind of recognition do we want our lives to attract? And when I read this passage in Mark, I think how Jesus was most recognized, and by extension, how we as believers should be recognized, is as someone who could bring a friend to, someone you could bring a friend to who needs help. And I think this needs to be a desire in our church, that this would be a safe place to bring those who are sick, those who need healing in all areas of their life, a place to bring them so that they may encounter, encounter Jesus and be healed and be forgiven and be made whole. A place of compassion where those who were once lost can become found. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for how much we can apply what we see in scripture to our lives today. And Lord, I pray that we would respond to that same call that you gave the disciples to come away with you by ourselves and get some rest. Help us, Lord, to examine our lives, to, to examine the rhythm of our lives. Help us, Lord, to, to do Sabbath better, to carve out times in our lives where we rest, we rejuvenate, that we come away with you and let you touch our lives in a very focused way. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity we have to be your hands and feet and to impact the people around us, the community around us. And Lord, I pray that you would deliver us from the temptation to, to just always see people as just wrong Help us to realize that they're wrong because they're lost. Help us, Lord, to, to have compassion upon those who are like, a sh like, a, like sheep without a shepherd. Help us, Lord, to be able to walk with those who are lost, even if they don't know it yet, and to be able to help them be found by you, and help them find you. And Lord, help us to think deeply about how we as Christians and as a church want to be recognized by the world around us. 
May we be recognized, Lord, not by their negative presuppositions. May we be recognized not by how we are in our worst day, but help us, Lord, to be recognized as those who follow you, who want to follow you, who have compassion. Help us, Lord, to be recognized as those who want to serve. Help us, Lord, to be recognized as those who want to come alongside those who need healing and need help and need forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to be recognized as the place to come if we feel lost, and as the place to come in order to feel found and to be found. Continue, Lord, to speak to our hearts and speak to our lives. In Jesus' name, 